Hey everybody, it's Alicia Reiser from Arise Above Occupational Therapy, and today we're going to talk about neurological vision disorders that can impact function, some of which you may not have even thought of before. So just a quick review, we're going to talk about the three-component model of vision, looking at visual integrity, visual efficiency, and visual information processing. In terms of visual integrity, there may be a lot of comorbidities that we have to consider when working with the neurological patient. We should consider if they're nearsighted or farsighted or if they have an astigmatism and when the last time they were actually to their eye care professional for a checkup. We should consider if they possibly have a history of glaucoma, which is high pressure in the eye on the optic nerve resulting in a peripheral field loss. We also have to consider if they have macular degeneration, which is a deterioration of the central retina resulting in a central field loss, or if they have a cataract, which is a clouding of the lens causing blurred and unclear vision. We want to keep all of these visual integrity disorders in the back of our mind because they can be impacted even further by visual efficiency disorders. So let's quickly review what visual efficiency skills are. They include ocular motor skills like saccades and pursuits. They look at vergence, including convergence, looking near, and divergence, looking far, and accommodation, which involves your lens changing shape based on where you're looking. For ocular motor skills, we want to remember that saccades are looking from stationary target to stationary target like when we're reading, and pursuits are following a moving object, so when you're looking at a ball coming at you or if you're following a fly around the room. And lastly, let's talk about visual information processing. So if we go top to bottom, left to right, we're looking at such skills as visual sequencing, figure ground, visual memory with spelling, visual closure, form constancy, visual motor integration, directionality and laterality, and finally, overall visual discrimination. You may already be familiar with things that can happen with visual field loss after suffering from a stroke. When an infarct happens anterior to the optic chiasm, you can see that the deficit happens on the ipsilateral or on the same side. When the infarct happens at the optic chiasm, you get bilateral peripheral loss. And when the infarct happens posterior to the chiasm, you get contralateral or opposite side deficits. You may already be aware of a homonymous hemianopia, but also be aware that these issues can happen just in quadrants as well. This is what makes it difficult at times to figure out what's going on functionally, because if it's only in the upper or the lower quadrant where the visual field loss is occurring, sometimes the patient may seem functional and other times maybe not. I think we're always trying to figure out if there's an actual field loss or a field cut, or if there's an inattention or if there's a neglect. But there are other things that can also occur visually when you've suffered from a stroke. So there are rapid eye movements that can occur that are known as nystagmus, and those can either be horizontal, vertical, or rotary or torsional. You can also have what's known as a scotoma, which is a partial blind spot located in any portion of your visual field. There can also be ocular motor issues because your eye muscles are, are impacted by the nerves that are conducting impulses to make your eyes move. We also want to remember that our lens is also controlled by muscles, which are controlled by nerves and action potentials. So if this is delayed or doesn't occur fast enough or quick enough, it can result in blurry vision as well. We may not always think about visual issues that can occur with Parkinson's disease, but there are definitely some things that can also happen here. A lot of ocular motor dysfunctions impacting saccades and pursuits can happen due to issues in the basal ganglia, which aren't releasing enough dopamine, in the cerebellum, because of a taxic movement, and in the thalamus, which is controlling sensory motor input. Other issues that can also happen are dry eye due to decreased blinking, diplopia because of muscle control with vergence, 
and also changes in color perception, especially blue and green. One of the main eye concerns with multiple sclerosis is the development of an optic neuritis, and that's just the inflammation of the optic nerve coming out of the back of the eye. Presentation includes sudden loss of either one eye or complete vision, pain with movement of that affected eye, changes in the pupillary reflex, loss of color, especially red vision, and an occurrence known as Oudhoff's phenomenon. So as the body temperature increases and as the person with MS gets more active and heated up, visual acuity actually worsens in terms of what the person can see. So in addition to optic neuritis, which is inflammation of the optic nerve, there are other issues that can also go along with MS due to the demyelinization of the optic nerve. So if we think about how demyelinization impacts action potentials hopping along the axon, we can see how it can also create issues with acuity impacting the lens, blurry vision, and diplopia infecting the muscles of the eye coordinating vergence. In terms of function, we're looking at difficulty with such things as reading, driving, scanning in your kitchen or in your bedroom for clothing, or even just picking out an outfit. Things that can happen after a concussion or an acquired brain injury include things occurring with eye integrity, like we've talked about before, optic nerve lesions anywhere along the path from your eye to your occipital lobe. You can also have a retinal detachment, so you want to ask if they are having any flashes of light and you want to get them to an eye care professional as soon as possible if they are having complaints of that. And you can also have what's known as a lens subluxation where the lens actually shifts and moves down the front of the eyeball. This may not be as obvious as it is in this picture, so complaints may be a lot of blurry vision. There are so many things that can go wrong with eye efficiency skills after sustaining a concussion or an acquired brain injury. This is why it's so important if patients are complaining of issues with double or blurred vision to get them to the appropriate eye care professional. Most of you have probably heard about convergence insufficiency, which is when you're having trouble looking at near things after a concussion, causing double vision. But there's also things that can occur like accommodation insufficiency, accommodative excess or spasm, accommodative infacility, which is when the lens doesn't change quick enough over a set period of time. You can also have convergence excess where you're over converging. You can have divergence insufficiency or divergence excess. And you can also have saccadic dysfunctions where you're hypermetric or hypometric and issues with pursuits, all causing headaches or nausea or impacting function overall. And lastly, you can have issues with visual information processing skills such as figure ground, where you have trouble discriminating foreground and background, visual closure, where you have trouble mentally completing shapes, visual motor integration, where you're trying to coordinate eye and hand or eye and foot movement, form constancy, knowing that when a shape is turned upside down, that it's still the same shape. This is impacted with knowing your letters like B, D, P, and Q. Visual discrimination, figuring out what's different from one picture to another. Visual spatial skills like laterality and directionality. Visual memory, which is impacted with spelling, remembering the sequence of certain letters to spell a certain word. And with visual sequential memory, like making patterns. So one of the most important things to remember when working with the neurologic population is that we're not just looking at visual field and visual integrity. We're looking at the skills that are impacted by the movement of our muscles and coordinating structures of the eye so that we can see single and clear. We must also remember that those best served to make those diagnoses are eye care professionals, either behavioral optometrists, developmental optometrists, neuro-optometrists, and if you're trying to find some in your area, two great websites to look at are the College of Vision Development, or covd.org, and the Neuro-Optometric Rehab Associates.
There are times when different kinds of prisms will serve best different kinds of diagnoses. So if you're having double vision, you might need a based out prism. If you're having double vision, you might need a Fresnel lens. If you have a visual field deficit, you might need a Pelly lens. And those are best prescribed by a specialized optometrist. So thank you for taking the time to watch our video on other things that can happen with neurological diagnoses. It's always great to remember that it's not just about visual field and visual acuity when we're looking at this population. If you liked what you saw and you're interested in seeing more videos, please click like and subscribe. And if you would like to click on the bell for more notifications when our next video comes out, please do so. Thanks for watching and always remember that OT can help.